I, um, yeah, I, I think we need to start praying to the four-armed emperor. have our quick review of Codex Tyranids, the latest instalment in Ninth Edition Codex is sent to me kindly for free by Games Workshop to review. I didn't pay for this. They sent it to me to review it. And I've been reading this book for a little while and um, it's quite interesting. If you're new to the channel, this is the second instalment in my new type of review series. We're not going to do a full review. We're not going to read the whole Codex. We're not going to read it page for page. We're not going to cover every data sheet. If you want to see that kind of review, best place to go, Winters SEO. He typically does it. I also filmed a battle report with Winters SEO on Thursday of this week that will be going up tomorrow, so Sunday, the, what, 10th of April, where you'll see the new Tyranids in action. And I took Harlequin to see if the new Tyranids could stand up to the strongest faction in 40k right now. Now, I've read this book, I've skimmed through it, and we're going to pull out our 15 important points. We break this down into five different sections, and if you've seen the Aldari Codex, you know what they are, but we're going to use the same different five headers. So we're going to pick the three biggest changes to Tyranids, the three biggest winners in the Codex, the three biggest losers, three standout units, and my three favourite stratagems. That's what we're going to cover. We're hopefully going to give you a quick overview as to how the Tyranids work, what you should be looking out for, what you might see on the tabletop in the future, and why I actually think this book is very, very good. So Tyranids have struggled in previous editions. They are We're talking about a race that's supposed to be feared by every other race in the galaxy. They have an unquenchable appetite. You can't stop them. They devour everything in their path and leave nothing but a barren rock in its wake. And we haven't really seen that. We see carnifixes and hive tyrants bouncing off of rhinos and not really picking up vehicles. We just don't see them being as frightening or as devastating as they should be narratively. Now, they have had a bit of a resurgence in 9th edition because of Leviathan Supplement, Crusher Stampede, etc. But that does mean that if you want to run Tyranids in a way that is slightly competitive and might actually do some damage to you, you need about 455 different books with all the supplements that Games Workshop have released because, you know, it's too hard to put it in one publication so instead now you could potentially just take this codex and probably do quite well with tyranids so they're, they're looking quite quite spicy they're looking quite nice in this codex but i don't want to waffle i don't want to try and talk to you about all the problems tyranids used to have let's just focus on the good let's jump into this review and so like the adari review we're going to start off with the three biggest changes to tyranids um, there's a fair few, in fact there's a lot of changes to Tyranids, and I think that the majority of them, 99% of them, are positive changes. But I have picked out the three biggest changes. The first of those biggest changes is what's called hyper-adaptions. So we still have high fleet adaptions, you've still got Hydra, you've still got Kronos, you've still got Leviathan, you've still got Kraken, etc. You've still got all those high fleet adaptions, and they give you a specific rule, like your chapter tactic. Um, and I won't I won't spoil some of them for you already, but they give you a specific rule, so they might give you a bonus to your AP or a bonus to this or a bonus to that. But you also have a hyper adaption as part of your high fleet adaption, and your hyper adaption gives you an additional rule, so it's like a second or third part of your chapter tactic. And some of these are quite good; they're quite nice as well. Every single high fleet gets a hyper adaption. Now, the reason why the hyper adaption is separate is because you can, in fact, choose to trade that hyper adaption out. And you do it before the first battle round begins, so you can do it on a opponent-by-opponent opponent basis. Now, that's really narrative, because it means the Tyranids are learning. They're consuming matter, learning their prey, and adapting like the hive mind's supposed to. Um, and it's really strong and powerful as well, because you get to pick from normally one of two tables. So depending on the hive fleet you pick, it will tell you that you can swap the high production with one of two tables. You have the hunt, lurk, and feed biomorphs. So that used to be the instinctive behaviours. They've kind of got rid of that. You've just got hunt, feed, and lurk biomorphs now and if you want to you can swap your hyper adaption out with whichever one of those lists it tells you that you can swap them out for and you can do it like i said at the start of the first battle round really 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 powerful really really nice you can see that you're playing harlequins or you're playing eldar or you're playing guard or you're playing knights and you can pick and choose which your high fleet adaption is going to be love it very narrative very strong 
So the second biggest change, we've kind of seen this already, but it's changed. It's called synaptic link range, okay? So synaptic link range currently with Tyranids means you can pay some points to give a unit something that you can then bounce off to give to another. It's, it's okay, it kind of works. That bouncing hasn't gone away, but it's and it's explained with a graph, which sounds like it's going to be bad, but it's actually not that bad. So synaptic link range basically means you can daisy chain synaptic characters or synaptic units. And then what you can do is choose to affect a unit that's in synapse range of the end unit in the daisy chain. If that unit is too far away, it breaks the daisy chain and then you can't link it. It's as simple as that. You're basically bouncing an ability or a power down synaptic link range. So you have your Hive Tyrant, you have a unit of Tyranid Warriors, you have a unit of Zoanthropes. Uh, the Warriors are within six inches of the of the Hive Tyrant, the Zoanthropes are within six inches of the, or I don't remember the range, I think it might be 12 inches of the um, of the, of the Warriors. That means that you can give your Hive Tyrant ability to the Zoanthropes despite the fact that they're 12 inches away. Uh, it's really nice. I really like the idea of being able to bounce things down there. But the reason why it's so such a big deal is because lots more things are in synaptic link range now. So we have, for example, synaptic imperative abilities. You don't pay for these. You just get them depending on the units that you select. So if you select a unit of zoanthropes and you put them in your army, you get access to that imperative. If you select a broodlord and you put him in your army, you get access to his imperative. There are specific ability that you can use once per battle. You pick it in your command phase, and then everything that's within synapse range benefits from that synaptic imperative ability, which is really, really nice. You can only pick that ability once per battle, so you can't pick the same ability two or three times and you can't pick that ability if the unit you're using isn't on the battlefield so if your zoanthropes are off the battlefield you can't use their synaptic imperative ability so synapse has become a real big deal which it should do for tyranids so again i think it's a very narrative change some of the other things that have changed so synaptic abilities now exist on data sheets so certain characters can give abilities to certain other units that are within link range for example the swarm lord can make certain units objective secured which is really really nice they just have to be in link range not in range of him they can just have to be in synaptic link range which is great the other big thing however is that psychic powers most of, if not all of, the psychic powers only require you to be in synaptic link range. This is a really strong change. Because what it does mean, and Winters did this to me, what it does mean is you can keep your psyker outside of Deny the Witch range, and you can bounce your psychic power down the battlefield and affect a unit that is within six, seven, eight inches of my psyker, despite the fact that your psyker is 40 inches away or 30 inches away, if you bounce it effectively enough. That's a really strong ability. Being able to bounce psychic powers down the battlefield is a really, really, really strong position for Tyranids to be in. And it's all narrative. It's synapse as well. It may be a little bit too strong being able to throw abilities across anywhere. But it also typically stops the castling. It stops those units having to be stuck really close together. And I kind of, I'm all for that. I don't, you know, I don't like castles, right? I'm not, I mean, I like real castles, just not tabletop castles. And so we move on to the third biggest change. And I've kind of encompassed lots into one with this one monsters now if you look through the codex if you get your hands on the Tyranid codex next week and you look through the codex you'll notice that most of if not all of the data sheets have been tweaked here and there there's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of changes but the one that really stood out for me the most is that Tyranids are monsters they are monsters now and the monsters feel like monsters lots of toughness improvements lots of AP improvements that's a big big difference it massively increases their survivability warriors have all moved up to toughness five zoanthropes and venomthropes are up to toughness five um the Turvigan's toughness eight the ex not the exocrine the hersperex is toughness eight carnifixes have got 11 attacks on the charge like monsters feel like monsters now they're absolutely terrifying and in places they're really hard to put down there's lots more two up armor saves lots more the swarm lord's gone up to nine attacks he's toughness eight with a two up armor save he is frightening he is hard to put down and he's frightening and that's the way monsters should be in a tyranid army they should be scary they should be frightening and i like the fact that we're going to see a lot more monsters on the tabletop and with that we're going to move into the three biggest winners of the codex and the reason why we're going to move straight into the three biggest winners of the codex is because the first winner for me is monsters i know i've just said it's a big change and it is a big change but they're also a winner They've gained, like I said, attacks across the board. They've gained durability. They've gained better armor. They're just, they've, they've typically gained better weapon skill as well. Carnifixes used to hit on, I think they used to hit on fours with like four or five attacks. 
On the charge now, a Screamy Killer will hit you on threes with 11 attacks. 11 attacks hitting on threes. That's really, 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 really scary. There's a couple of abilities that you can also chuck in there from uh, stratagems and stuff. Again, I won't ruin some of the latter part of this video that just makes them that little bit more scary as well. Obviously, adding certain psychic powers and synaptic link abilities. And monsters are just in a good place right now. And I'm not even considering, at this point, I'm not even considering Crusher Stampede on the off chance that Games Workshop do turn around and say, actually, Crusher Stampede is no longer allowed to be used and you have to just use the new codex. Nothing stops that right now, to be clear. You can still take Crusher Stampede. Having said that, if you do take Crusher Stampede, you do lose your High Fleet Adaption and you'll then therefore lose the Hyper Adaption. And I think I'd rather have that. And when you get your hands on the codex, you'll probably see why. But you would lose Crusher Stampede. You would um, lose the High Fleet Adaption if you take crusher stampede or you take the high fleet adaption you lose crusher stampede crusher stampede made monsters scary anyway they're even more scary now you you definitely at the moment if it's allowed crusher stampede you definitely it's still definitely viable you still can use it because wounds have gone up across the board and all sorts as well monsters are definitely a winner for me another winner this is a controversial one uh, and the reason why this is controversial is because it's already hyper popular and used everywhere high fleet leviathan and High Fleet Leviathan is a winner for one main reason, and that is its High Fleet Adaption. Not its Hyper Adaption, it's High Fleet Adaption. So it's High Fleet Adaption that says any Synapse unit gets transhuman, and any non-Synapse unit gets mini-transhuman. And when I say mini-transhuman, I mean it can't be wounded on ones and twos. So any Synapse unit, which is lots of your big monsters, your Tyranid Warriors, your Zoanthropes, can't be wounded on a one, two, or a three. And anything else can't be wooden on ones and twos. It's it's really, really good. And that's before you've picked your hyper adaption. So your hyper adaption isn't one of those. You just get both of those for being Leviathan. You can see now why you might not want to take Crusher Stampede. Crusher Stampede does give you a five plus invulnerable save, granted. Crusher Stampede does give you minus one damage. There's other ways to get access to the latter, but with that with that ability to give all your sign-up scriptures. Um, transhuman i don't know if i think that's better i think it probably is i'd rather stop them from wounding in the first place than take the gamble with the third save i think it's probably better mm. leviathan are good and the last biggest winner for me in the codex psychic units um there's a number of reasons for psychic units being a winner the biggest one is what we've already spoken about that synaptic link range that ability to bounce psychic powers all over the board is really good the powers aren't bad anyway the tyranny powers have never been horrendous they're just not that but they're just pretty good onslaught being able to advance and charge with onslaught and being able to pick a unit within a synaptic link range is really 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 nice because you can do your movement and race ahead and still bounce a power down to that unit that can fix or whatever it might be that has already advanced and allow it to advance and charge with onslaught that's really really nice the other reason why psychos are a winner though Shadow in the warp still a thing, so you're still affecting other unit psychic abilities. But also, every single high fleet gets their own unique psychic power. So there's more psychic powers available to you as well. It's really nice, more flavor, more psychic powers for your individual high fleets. Psychics are just flat better in Tyranids. And again, it makes sense. I'm okay with it. But that means we now have to move into the worst part, the three biggest losers. And there are some losers. Now, when you look at the codex and you read through the book, you will notice that most units have, ha have had improvements. They just flat got better. They've made lots of tweaks to lots of data sheets. There's lots and lots and lots of changes. The hardest part about that review is, or this review is, I can't, it was hard to pick three winners. There's lots of other winners in the codex. There's more that I could I could touch on. I've had to take a couple of them out of winners and put them into my three favourite standout units because I, I would have too many winners. I've, there's too many good stratagems. So it's really, really hard to nail this down. I've got three biggest losers. I have got them. And there is kind of a fourth, which we'll talk about in just a second. We'll start off, though, with what I've picked as the three biggest losers. And first on the list, unfortunately, is Gene Stealers. Gene Stealers is a strange one. To start with, Gene Stealers have a different profile to those that are in Gene Stealer Cult. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but they do have a different profile. It is what it is. That's not why they've lost, though. Gene Stealers still aren't a bad unit, to be clear. They're still a good unit. And they can infiltrate now, which Gene Stealers should be able to do. So they're still a good unit. The reason why they're a loser is because typically they've been the troops' choice for every Tyranid player for as long as I can remember. And people have got lots and lots and lots of gene sealers. 
So imagine you've got 60, 70, 80 gene stealers and you love gene stealers and that's the list you've been running for so long. You're going to be pretty annoyed. You'll be pretty pissed off when you find out that they've moved to the elite's choice and they've changed to a maximum unit size of 10. Now, to be clear, I don't want 20 gene stealers infiltrating. So they should have reduced the unit size if they're giving them infiltrate. And I'm I'm kind of okay with them being elites. They're just a loser because... It means that an army that you've had previously, if you didn't have any other troop choices, is now you can't run it as a battalion. It's now invalid because geniuses have moved to elites and they've changed to 10 man units. It's going to upset some people with that because it means they're going to have models that, if you had 40, 50 gene stealers, 10 or 20 of those in strike force now, you just can't flat use them. You just can't. That hurts people. Another big loser, and I think we're all probably really happy for this one, is Hive Guard. Again, not a bad unit. Still an okay unit, but they're no longer an auto-include. Their firepower has been significantly reduced. They can't just flat fire out a line of sight now. Um, there's other ways you can fire out a line of sight, but they can't just do it. Um, and their weapons are nowhere near as powerful as they used to be. I, I, I'm not going to dwell on this one. They're still a good unit. I just don't think anyone's going to complain at the fact that we're probably not going to see 18 Hive Guard anymore in a Tyranid list. That's probably a good thing. I don't understand how we ever thought it was a good idea to have a unit where you could run 18 of them, fire out a line of sight, hide them, non-interactive for your opponent, sit there, blow them off the board. It was a bit dull and boring. I'm, I'm really glad that they've seen the nerf bat. To be clear, like I said, they're not bad. They're just not as good as they used to be. They're definitely not the auto-include that we saw them as previously. The third and final main loser, and there is an extra mention in a minute for a different unit, but the third and final main user is Ripper Swarms. Ripper Swarms also used to be troops' choices. You would typically see Ripper Swarms in things like monster mash lists, and the reason why you would see them is because you could just take them as a mandatory troops' choice, use them to hold your objectives because they were obsec, and then let your monsters go and do your thing, and they were cheap. Well, Games Workshop have clearly noticed this. Rippers have now moved to fast attack. So they now are no longer troops, and they lose obsec. They are more than useless now. They have no toughness. They have no real save. They've got no real decent attacks. They've got a terrible weapon. They don't have obsec. And more importantly, they can't be used as mandatory slots in any detachment if your army's battlefield, uh, battleforged. So rippers are just flat bad. I don't... I'm not entirely sure why you'd use them. I, just bin your rippers. Just bin them or use them as basing material. That's probably the best way to go. I did say there was a special mention. There is a special mention. This is because much like the Eldari Codex, when there was a feels bad for those people that had converted their Viper jet bikes to have two shuriken cannons, we have another similar situation in the Tyranid Codex. One of the other strongest choices that people took during 8th edition specifically, and I think perhaps even previously, was a winged hive tyrant with two twin link devourers with brain, brain leech worms. Do you remember that? Those fly runs that just flew around with lots and lots and lots of DACA? Hmm. Lots of people bought special DACA arms to stick to their fly runs. Specifically, lots of conversions happened just to get to a point where you could field said fly run with your twin link devourers with brain leech worms. Apart from the fact that you can't take that weapon option anymore. Winged Hive Tyrants no longer have access to Twin Link Devourers with Brain Leech Worms. And I'm not saying I'm surprised. The, the weapon option is not available in the kit, and Games Workshop are typically making changes whereby you can only build what is available in the kit. It's the same with the Viper. You can't build two Shuriken Cannons in the Viper, so they've taken the option off of you. They've done this here as well. They've taken the option off of Hive Tyrants to take Twin Link Devourers with Brain Leech Worms, which means all those people that I know who have got them, they're now no longer valid. You can't field them anymore. That's going to hurt people. That's going to sting a little bit. I think that is a bold choice. I understand why they've done it, but it does make Fly Rinse a loser. Now, to be clear, Fly Rinse are really, really good. So they are not a loser. This is why I didn't put them as one of the main biggest losers, because they are not a loser. Fly Rinse are still very good now, but those of you that have converted them, I'm not saying you're a loser, to be clear but you've lost because that model is no longer valid and you're going to have to work out how you might maybe pull it apart or change it or use it in the future. I'm not sure. It's going to sting a little bit. It is a bit of a feels bad. But we're going to come away from feels bads. We're going to go back to positive. We're going to come on to three standout units in the Tyranid Codex. We're going to kick it off with probably a surprise choice. Tyranid Warriors. Now, I've just said that we've lost Rippers from the Troops' Choice. We've lost... Uh, geniuses from the troop choice well warriors have stayed in a troop choice slot 
So they have objective secured and they've stayed there as Synapse core units. So they're Synapse. So they're very important for Synaptic Link. You can bounce psychic powers through them. You can bounce imperative abilities through them. You can bounce synaptic link abilities through them. They are core, which means they gain all those benefits that we're seeing from core with rerolls, etc., because they are a core unit. More importantly, they've gone up to toughness five, and they're three wounds each, and their weapons are pretty deadly. And there's some other things that you can layer onto them in order to make them better. Additionally, in, in terms of weapons, strat uh, stratagems, etc. Additionally, if you take a unit of warriors, you can take a Tyranid Prime without taking up a HQ slot. And Tyranid Prime, who is essentially a warrior, allows all coring, I think maybe character units within six inches to reroll wound rolls of one. To be clear, that's not warriors within six inches. That's core units within six inches of Tyranid Prime can reroll wound rolls of one. So you take a unit of warriors, you can take him without using up a HQ slot. You get reroll wound rolls of one for core units within six inches of him. That's really strong. Warriors being toughness five, strength five is very, very good. If you give them bone swords, they go up to strength seven. And if you give them adrenal glands, they go up to strength eight. Strength eight bone fits, bone swords, who are, I think they're AP minus two. Let me check quickly. Bone swords are AP minus two with two damage each. And if you give them dual bone swords, they get an additional attack. That puts them up to four attacks. Strength eight, minus two, two damage. They're not unwieldy power fists because they're also now hitting on threes. Warriors got really good and they're a core troops choice. So they're going to have objective secured. Don't forget their synapse. So you put them in Leviathan and they get transhuman. Toughness five, transhuman warriors in Leviathan. If you take a unit of zoanthropes, their synaptic imperative ability will give them a five up in vulnerable save whilst that ability is active. It is only one battle round. Toughness five, transhuman, five up in vulnerable save. You can also bounce to them catalyst. You bounce catalyst to them, they have a five up feel no pain. You can take them in units of up to nine. It's pretty frightening. And there's some stratagems I'm going to talk about, or a single stratagem at least, that you can layer onto these guys that makes them even more survivable. Warriors, I think, are really good now, and I think we'll see them as a core choice for a lot of players. Next big standout unit for me, probably my favourite unit in the Tyranid Codex, so there might be a little bit of bias here, but that's Zoanthropes. Now, Zoanthropes did have a minor nerf. They no longer have three up in vulnerable saves. Not to be confused, of course, with the Neurothrope, who is the HQ choice, who does still have a three up in vulnerable save, but Zoanthropes no longer have a three up in vulnerable save. They just have a four plus in vulnerable save. However... They have also gone up to Toughness 5, and they've increased to 4 wounds. So Toughness 5, 4 wounds, 4 plus in Vulnerable save, already makes them pretty tasty. I'm already a big fan of Zoanthropes. But they've changed their psychic abilities, and they've just got flat better. So if you take 3 Zoanthropes in a unit, which is your minimum unit size, Warp Blast is a specific rule that they get, which means that for every model in the unit... When casting a witch firepower, not just smite, a witch firepower, you get plus one to cast. So a minimum unit of three starts at plus three. A maximum unit of six would be at plus six to cast. Okay? That's for witch fire. So unit of six would get plus six to cast smite. Right? The other part of that rule states that when casting smite specifically, no other witch fire, for every model in the unit you plus one to the number of mortal wounds the zoanthropes do to a maximum of three additional mortal wounds. That's incredible. So if you have six zoanthropes in the unit, you're casting smite on 2d6 plus six, and if you get a super smite, it'll be d6 plus three mortal wounds. That's very, very good. I think zoanthropes are really, really nice, and they have an ability like the Tyranid Warriors. So basically, if it's Battleforged and you have a unit of Zoanthropes, you can take a Neurothrope without taking up a HQ slot. There's lots of really cool HQs. So now, my battalion, if I've got a unit of Warriors and I've got a unit of Zoanthropes, I can have a Neurothrope and I can have a Tyranid Prime and I can have the Swarm Lord and I've still got a mandatory HQ slot spare and a non mandatory HQ slot spare. I've still got two more HQ slots I can take. And I've got Turvigons, and I've got Trigon Primes that are now HQ, and I've got Broodlords, which you get for free if you take uh, Gene Stealers. Uh, really nice. Really nice way to put this army together. Zoanthropes are probably going to be seen quite a lot, I reckon. So the last biggest winner in the Codex is, for me, Carnifixes. And I've said Carnifixes, but what I've actually done is I've grouped three data sheets together under the single title of Carnifixes. They're called different things in the Codex. One is called a Carnifix, 
One is called a Screamer Killer, and one is called a Thornback. Either way, they're still Carnifixes. A Carnifix has lots of mismatch of weapons. You can pick and choose and change and lots of um, customization for it. A Screamer Killer is melee-focused, and a Thornback is ranged-focused. But they're all Carnifixes. Each one can be taken in units of one to three, and then when you deploy them, they deploy separately on the tabletop. But imagine this. You can take three screamer, three units of three Screamer Killers, three units of three uh, Thornbacks, three units of three... Can't, well, I mean, you probably can't for points. But you could take, what is that, 9, 18, 27 Carnifixes and be Battleforged. So Carnifixes, there's a lot you can take now. I think Winter's told me that three units of three Screamer Killers is just over a thousand points. And they've got some buffs to them. So a Screamer Killer is base attacks 10. And if he makes a successful charge, he gets plus one to his attacks profile. So he attacks with... 11 attacks he is only still strength user which is strength six but he is ap minus three flat three damage and there are some stratagems that you can use he moves 10 inches he now hits on threes all carnifixes are minus one damage they're basically dreadnoughts they've all got nine wounds with minus one damage with a, a two up armor save now the dreadnoughts with terminator armor that have got minus one damage at toughness seven it's nice right absolutely lovely and um, they've got they've got some other little abilities depending on which ones you pick um so for example thornback stop things from um firing overwatch etc but yeah i'm a big fan of kind fixes some decent upgrades in them and a couple of stratagems and they're quite they're actually quite frightening now but you can take loads of them because they're split into three different data sheets big fan of that kind fixes are definitely something that i think we'll start to see even more of now and I love Screamer Killers. They're one of my favourite things in the world, Screamer Killers. So I, I, I do wish they had a slightly a slightly bigger strength increase. If I'm looking at a, a Screamer Killer with its monstrous Screamer Killer talons, I would have liked that to be strength 7 or 8 rather than strength 6. I don't like the fact that it's ruining a rhino on 5s. But uh, I'm still a fan. They're still a standout unit. I still think we'll see them being very strong. So the final part of the review is the three standout stratagems for me. Um, there's a couple in here that I'm not too blown away by. Uh, too blown away by. It's a couple that, for example, are about lictors, and I'm not sure we'll see loads of lictors. Lictors only became popular for a very brief moment once people could use them for retrieve Octarius data. Now you can't. They're going away again. They saw a, a resurgence for about a month. Um, but otherwise, uh, there is some that aren't that amazing in here. They're, they're decent. They're not terrible. But there is some really good stratagems. Uh, there is a specific stratagem that I want to shout out to. I think it was Winters was using. It might be Kronos. I can't remember. I'll have to have a look in a minute. Basically, it allows you to automatically advance eight inches. Kraken? Kraken. Automatically advance eight inches. That's the one. It was a high fleet Kraken. So he could move his Screamer Killer Carnifix ten inches, auto advance eight inches, so he could move his Carnifix 18 inches. He then bounced Onslaught onto said Carnifix and was then allowed to advance and charge. That was frightening. That's a quick moving Carnifix. That was pretty devastating, that. However, that is a stratagem specific to a high fleet, so I don't really want to pick it for my three standout stratagems. So I've picked three others. We're going to start off with Reinforced Hive Node. Now, the reason why I'm picking Reinforced Hive Node is because it's specific to one of my favourite standout units, and that's now Tyranid Warriors. Because Reinforced Hive Node, you pick a Tyranid Warrior or a Tyranid Prime unit, and it's minus one damage... That's really... So, Toughness 5, 3 wounds. Transhuman in Leviathan, and you can make them minus 1 damage. Tyranid Warriors are no longer going to fall over like they used to. Really good stratagem. Single command point. It can cost 2 if you contain more than 5 models. So, if you are a 9 unit... A model of... Uh, if you are a unit of 9 Warriors, it will cost you 2 CP. If you're 5 or less, it costs cost you 1 command point. Really good. My next favourite stratagem for one command point is Voracious Appetite. And the reason why I love Voracious Appetite is because it specifically targets Tyranid monster units. I've told you that monsters are a winner. I've told you that Screamer Killers are a thing and Carnifixes are a thing. Morlocks are monsters that now get 16 attacks. Trigons are monsters. The Swarm Lords are monster who gets 9 attacks at strength 9, minus 3, flat 3 damage. So lots of really frightening monsters out there already. Voracious Appetite is a single command point. You pick a Tyranid monster unit and they can re-roll wound rolls. So that Screamer Killer might only have 11 attacks at strength 6, but you can reroll all wound rolls and he's minus 3 flat 3 damage. It's really nice. Really makes them efficient. Really tasty on things like the Swarm Nod. But even on something like a Morlock, 16 attacks hitting on 3s that I think is strength 6 or 7 AP minus 1, 1 damage, but you can reroll wounds. Pretty tidy that. It's a decent stratagem. 
The final stratagem was a hard one to pick. I wanted to pick a stratagem called Blinding Venom for a single command point, which is really good for gargoyles. I should mention uh, a special mention to gargoyles. I wanted to also chuck them into the winners list, and I ran out of space because gargoyles have moved into troops. So gargoyles are no longer fast attack. They've swapped with rippers. They've moved to troops. So you've now got a 12-inch fly unit with objective secured that aren't that expensive. So gargoyles are good there. And if you spend a command point on Blinding Vellum, um, you could pick a gargoyles unit in your army and until the end of the phase, an enemy model uh, makes an attack against it that hit roll can't be re-rolled. And a melee attack against those gargoyles is minus one. So you just make those gargoyles more survivable, which have got obsec, so that's quite tasty. But what I've actually picked is Corrosive Viscera. Corrosive Viscera is two command points and you use a strategy with a fight phase when a model uh, which has the, uh, sorry, a model in an acid blood unit is selected as the target. And basically, every time it would lose a wound, you roll a 4+. So you lose the wound, but you roll a 4+. And on a 4+, the attacking unit, this is in melee, suffers a mortal wound. Up to a maximum of 6. So I charge you, I fight you in melee, it's melee only. You take 8 wounds, you roll 8 dice, and on 4+, I suffer mortal wounds, and I've attacked you. It's re- it's a really not. It's going to make me really think hard, especially with things like single wound Harlequin players. They've got a four up of vulnerable, so they don't have a save against mortal wounds like that without relics or psychic powers. So that's a really tasty stratagem. I'm probably going to die, so I'll pop two CP on the off chance that I can do mortal wounds. Now, if you're talking about things like Haruspexes that have um have the acid blood keyword, 15, 16 wounds. So I think I'm going to take all 16 wounds. I'm going to get to roll 16 times and see if I can do four pluses and do more wounds. I quite like that. Two CPs is expensive, but it's a cool stratagem. And I think it's quite a strong stratagem. So there we have it. There is my 15 standout points from the Tyranid Codex. My three biggest changes, my three biggest winners, my three biggest losers, my three standout units, and finally my three favorite stratagems. As a encompassing overall review, though, the Tyranid book is really nice. I do not think it is Harlequin's Tau, maybe even Custodi's level of Broken Strong. I don't think it's there, but it is very good. It's a very good book. Tyranids are frightening again. I was playing against them yesterday with my Harlequins, and Harlequins are ridiculously powerful at the moment. And I had to really think at times. And it's partly because I'm a rubbish player, but it's also partly because Tyranids are very, very good. There's loads and loads and loads of stuff in that codex that I haven't managed to touch on because I'm trying to keep this format the same for all of my reviews. Um, but there's some really exciting things in there. So the Turvagon is very, very, very good now. She can spawn multiples new Termagants. You just get flat 10 extra Termagants per game by having her. You can just spawn 10 for free. You heal 2d6 each turn in each command phase in a Termagant unit. If you've got a unit of Termagants that are 15 or more within engagement range of her, then you can't target her. They basically count as bodyguard. Um, the Hive, not the Hive Commander, what's his name? The Swarm Lord. He's absolutely terrifying now. Old One Eye's very, very good. Neurothropes are really strong now. They can make things fight last and they give minus one to hit to all friendly units within six inches. The the book is just very, very nice. We haven't even touched on things like the Tyrann effects. 30 shots with its rupture cannon or D6 plus six shots with its flamer. It's, they're nice. Harpies are good. I like harp. There's just too much to love. Monster Mash is definitely a thing again, but I don't think it's just Monster Mash. They've changed the rules to things like Hormigants. So if you swarm Hormigants in now, you don't just get a model within half an inch of a model within half an inch. You get more ranks that can fight and bounding leap and attack. So you can swarm your Hormigants in and you're not punished for having 30 where 20 of them can't fight because of the models. You can get more in, in their version of engagement range. It's a really, really, really nice, really eloquently put together book. And the biggest thing for me about this codex, my, the biggest reason why this one has a thumbs up from me is that it's narrative. It's narrative. That's what I love about it. It's a narrative codex that fits narratively. If I was going to grade this codex out of 10, I'm going to probably give it an 8 to an 8.5 out of 10. It's very strong. It's very, very good. It's nowhere near, like I said, I don't think it's anywhere near um, Harlequin levels of powerful probably will still probably will still get beaten by Tau, but narratively it's on point there's a couple of losers like rippers don't seem to have a purpose now they're just kind of in there i might have missed something if you read this book and you think i've missed something please comment let me know 
But I think this is really, really cool. And I think this is a really strong codex. And I think Tyranid players are going to be quite happy with it. And when you look at the adaptive biomorphs, the synaptic link range, the synaptic imperative abilities, I also don't think it's too complicated. It looks frightening when you look at the graph, but I don't think it's too complicated. It's definitely nowhere near admec levels of complicated. And for that reason alone, I think it fits quite nicely. It's not as simple as I'd like it to be, but it's definitely nowhere near as bad as we've seen it. Good job, Games Workshop. Big fan of this. If you're a Tyranid player or a Tyranid fan, pick up this codex. The point in which this review goes live, this codex will be available for pre-order and it comes out next weekend. So 9, 16th of April. 16th of April, this codex will be available to purchase. It's a good book. If you're a Tyranid player, buy it. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed this review. If you are liking these types of reviews, please let me know in the comments below. If there's things you'd like to see slightly different, you can also let me know. There is no obligation, of course, for me to change the way we're doing this because I quite like these right now. Um, but it's been... It's been an enjoyable way of doing reviews because I actually have to sit and think about what's my favourite, which bits do I like, which bits don't I like. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have enjoyed it, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you're not already a subscriber to the channel, hit like for the video so more people can see this on YouTube and see there is a different way of doing reviews rather than just reading through the codex. More importantly, if you want to support me, you want to support the channel and you want to see this channel grow, there are a couple of ways you can do that. First of all, you can become a member of DeploymentZone.tv. Come and watch even more content from me and the fantastic Winters from the Winters SEO YouTube channel. Channel. equally you can become a channel member of this channel and there is perks attached if you click the join the channel button it will show you all the perks there's lots of different perks and um, don't forget we do stream every tuesday wednesday and friday tuesdays and fridays are 9 30 uk time wednesdays at 8 p.m and it's a live game of 40k but tuesdays and um, fridays are um our normal sit and talk streams that are a little bit like this this next wednesday i think winters is coming down possibly i might even try and get him to bring new tyranids that'd be cool wouldn't it uh, otherwise i think that covers everything hope you guys have enjoyed this review thank you very much for watching i'll see you in the next one